Hello, BioTube, this is AA Gerds, and today I am your host for Bionic Critical, and right now we are going to be looking into the Bionicle video game, which was created by Argonaut Games and published by LEGO Media and Electronic Arts. The game was released in 2003 for the Nintendo GameCube, original Xbox, PlayStation 2, Game Boy Advanced, and Microsoft Windows. The Mac OS X version of the game was released in 2004 by Feral Interactive. Now, 2003 was a very exciting and unique year for Bionicle, and not just for all the awesome sets like Makuta, Takanuva, and the Rakshi. This was when the Bionicle movie and video game were also being released, which I believe most fans were incredibly excited for. However, as awesome as the sets and movie were, the Bionicle game did not receive the same applause from consumers and game reviewers. IGN gave the game a 3.8 out of 10, and said it was only appropriate for LEGO-obsessed 8-year-olds. Game Informer awarded the game a far more merciful review, a 6.5 out of 10. The video game itself is incredibly lacking and disjointed, and the reason for this is because whoever was in charge wanted the game to be released around Christmas, so they could get all those Christmas sales. Naturally, the developers didn't have enough time to install all the content that was meant to be in the game, and so was born probably one of the worst Bionicle products ever. The only device that has most, if not all, the content that was meant to be in the game is the Game Boy Advanced. Most of this content were levels and story. For example, all the Toa in all their forms had a level. In other words, Kopaka Mata had a level and Kopaka Nuva had a level. The game was also supposed to start in the 2001 storyline, but because of those nasty deadlines, the developers decided to begin the story in the Borok Saga. The Bionicle video game is considered non-canon due to many errors in the story, several being that the story starts in the Borok Saga, the Rahi are still enslaved by Makuta via infected masks, and Jala never makes an appearance despite being a very prominent character in the Bionicle story. There are even some silly slip-ups, like the fact that all the Matoran and Tahu Matis level are Lee Matoran. Takanuva is known as Takuanuva due to a typo, and Rakshi apparently hold Krana instead of Krata. Now, let's get into a little bit more detail with this terrible story. It begins with Turaga Matau and Turaga Vakama composing a play for the Toa Mata. I personally noted that the Toa Mata were the only audience for the play. There was not a single Matoran in the stands. I thought that pretty dadgum narcissistic. Anyway, Takua decides to crash the play by announcing that he's being chased by strange creatures, which of course turn out to be Borok. The Toa engage and run off these Borok, and this is where you begin your adventure. You get to play as Toa Manta for the first two levels, those Toa being Tahu and Kopaka, and in these levels you fight Rahi and Borok, and in some cases rescue Matorn. After you finish level 2, which is Kopaka Mata's level, there is a cutscene where the heroes magically turn into the Toa Nuva. There is no mention of the Barag, there is no cutscene of a big battle underground with a swarm of Borok, you just see the Toa Mata turn into the Toa Nuva. So if you're someone who doesn't know the original story, this scene will most likely have you scratching your head. Anyway, the first Toa Nuva you play is Gali, and her immediate crisis is the Borok Kal terrorizing her home. Once you find their lair, you fight and defeat all six of the Kal, and then move on to Pohatu Nuva, Anua Nuva, Liwa Nuva, and Tahu Nuva. Tahu is the only character that is playable as both his Mata and Nuva forms. As you play the rest of the characters, you are mostly engaging with the Rakshi, which apparently just show up on the island from nowhere. It isn't until you get to Liwa Nuva's level, which is the sixth, that you get slightly more details about these new bosses. You only fight three of the Rakshi. Lirak, Panrak, and Kurak. Tahu is the last Toa that battles a Rakshi, which is Kurak trying to get away with the Mask of Light, which Takua found earlier in the game. Once Kurak is killed, the Mask of Light ends up at Takua's feet. It slowly levitates and latches itself to Takua's face, and then the Matoran is transformed into Takua Nuva, the Toa of Light. Takanuva, or Takuanuva, is the last level in the game, and this is where you finally engage Makuta directly. Once you destroy all of his minions and eventually Makuta himself, Takua Nuva, uh, sorry, not used to calling him that, Takua Nuva places the Mask of Light onto the Mask of Shadows and the two become Takuta Nuva. Takuta Nuva starts to beat on these two large doors and when they open, light floods through and it is implied that the Great Spirit Matsunui has been awakened. That's pretty much the story of the game in a nutshell. There are many more details, but to go over every single minute of the game would be more time than you're willing to spend, I'll bet. So let's get to the game mechanics now. 
The game is not terribly difficult. Sure, if you're 6 or 8 like I was when I first played the game, then it's probably going to present a bit of a challenge, especially the riding levels like Opaka and Pohatu's, or levels with challenging terrain like Lee was. However, in general, it just isn't a challenging game. If you want to just blow through, you can probably beat it in 2 or 2.5 hours. The controls are very basic. You have a jump button, an attack button, a special ability button, and a shield button that also doubles as an energy absorbing button. You see, you have two gauges on the top left corner of your screen, your health gauge and your energy gauge. The energy gauge dictates how many times you can attack, so if it runs out, you can no longer fight back. There are three ways to recharge your energy. 1. Wait for it to recharge on its own, which takes about a century. 2. Absorb enemy attacks with your shield, which become energy for you. And 3. Hold down the shield button and gather power from your surroundings. The third option is best performed in an area without enemies because while you are absorbing energy from your surroundings, you're vulnerable to enemy attacks. If you are in a fight and need to get more energy, then using the shield to counter enemy projectiles is your best option. The special ability button is kind of interesting and the only characters that don't make use of this are Tahu and Pohatu Nuva. Takanuva and Liwa use the button to fly, Kopaka uses it to activate his Kanohi Akaku, and Gali and Anua use it to perform a powerful attack called a Nuva Blast, which can be performed by holding down the shield button until your energy gauge is fully charged and then tapping the special ability button. Gali has an additional special ability, which is to swim very quickly underwater. For her, the special ability button basically doubles as a sprint button while she's underwater. The graphics in the game are kind of sloppy and dirty. I can't say much for the PC, Game Boy, and several of the others, but everything on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox looks like it's paper thin and the Toa are so scarred and dirty it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, I know they've been battling Rahi and the like for a while now, but at least make it appear that they take a bath every once in a while and make use of band-aids. And when the characters are talking? Turaga Nuju looks like a complete retard with his constantly open mouth, and Tahu looks like he has a paper-thin flap that doesn't even cover his entire mouth. The other characters are a little better when it comes to talking, but everyone's masks look like they are paper-thin if you turn the camera just right. However, some of the locations look pretty nice despite the poor graphics, my personal favorites being Liwa, Anua, and Gali's levels. Gawahi is incredibly lush and relaxing with the water, little tree copses, and yellow beaches, and the ruined buildings and wooden structures make the place look even cooler. Liwahi looks pretty green and lush, but it just feels neat when you're on top of a very stable platform and looking at the tops of the trees, which gives you an idea of just how high you are. I kind of hated you can't actually climb the tall trees in Liwa's level and get a good look around the island itself. I bet the view would look pretty good even with the crappy graphics. I like Anua's level because despite always being underground, the caves and tunnels Anua travels through look pretty diverse and have numerous traps. One cave has a bunch of Rahi and a puzzle you have to solve to get through the next door, and the next cave has a river of toxic waste that you have to jump across while you're dodging minecarts and enemy attacks. It's pretty scary the first time you go through Anua's level and you enter a room that suddenly has stones and stalactites raining down on your head. One of the real annoying things about this game is the camera. In order to look right, you have to turn the thumbstick left, and in order to look left, you have to turn the thumbstick right. The same thing when it comes to up and down. I don't know whose idea it was to reverse everything, but I kind of hope that he got a swift kick in the nuts after the game was released. The developers didn't even bother to add an option to reverse the already reversed camera controls, so you're pretty much stuck with this infuriatingly frustrating device. Many a time have I been killed from behind because of that dadgum camera. Also, in some parts of the game, it forces you to look in a specific direction, and while this at times makes things a little bit easier when you're trying to jump across feeble platforms and dodging traps, it can also prevent one from taking a look around. There were some parts of Lewis level that I wanted to observe more closely, but the freaking camera would force me to look down a certain part of the level and prevent me from observing the crappy scenery. So, while the controls are very simple, the graphics look like dog poop, the story and difficulty of the game are quite low and the camera is about as dangerous as the enemies themselves, the one redeeming quality this game has is the music. I think all the Bionicle fans are familiar with the main theme for the game, and I can say that the rest of the game has pretty good music as well. 
I really like the music in Liwa, Pohatu, and Gali's levels. In general, it's pretty fun and engaging, although another flaw the game had was sometimes the music wouldn't play at specific parts of the level, which was kind of annoying. Anyway, in the world of games, I'd give Bionicle a 3 or 4 out of 10. I really hate to say that, but I'd be lying if I said it was an awesome game and worth 60 bucks or something. However, for the sake of nostalgia and adding to your collection of nerdy Bionicle stuff, this isn't a bad piece to have in there. I believe you can still purchase the game for various devices on websites like Amazon and eBay, although some people charge a pretty huge amount for it. I've seen one copy of the game for $70, even though it's been 12 years since the game was released, and it wasn't even that popular. But hey, it's up to y'all about how much you're willing to spend for Bionicle stuff. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Bionic Critical. Be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe. For the next episode, we might go over the Bionicle comics, especially the artwork. However, we do not know how interested y'all are in silly artwork, so if this video gets 150 or 170 likes, we will make a review concerning the comics. So, if you want to see that, be sure to hit that like button. Anyway, thanks for watching and have a great week.